is London Clearing House, it's an entity in London. It's responsible for about 90% of the world's interest rate swap clearing. They have to employ thousands of people to maintain that exchange, right? And kind of, it still is extremely opaque and it's regulated uh, the hell out of in order to make sure that it kind of works as it should do for society. But why does that need to exist? I don't think it does. Like, I think the entire thing could be replaced with smart contracts. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. Uh, we are joined today, not by Santi, but my uh, my trusted co-founder, Mr. Mike Ippolito. And we are very lucky to be joined by Simon, jo- uh, Simon Jones, CEO and co-founder of uh, Bolts Protocol. Simon, welcome to the show, man. Hey, nice to be here. Yeah. Yeah, great to have you here. So for folks who don't know Volts, Volts is uh, an AMM for interest rate swaps. We had Simon on another BlockWorks podcast called Bell Curve, really highly uh, listened to and just enjoyed episode talking about like interest rate swaps episode. Uh, What Simon is building at Volts is kind of sitting at the intersection of really how do we build this like large uh, and transformative uh, fixed income ecosystem in DeFi. And um, we want to bring Simon back on the podcast because Volts just published this really interesting research paper exploring the relationship between TradFi rates and DeFi rates, which is a really interesting topic that Mike and I talk about uh, and Santi and I talk about all the time, right? If you were thinking about the bull market, uh, a lot of folks got pulled into DeFi because these super high rates, right? Like people, there was the meme, you know, what, what, what interest rate do you get in your bank account? It was like 0.0001%. And then like on Aave, you can get like 10% or something. That meme has kind of gone away as rates are actually lower in DeFi now than they are in TradFi um, on, on the lending side. So anyways, we just wanted to bring Simon on to explore that paper um, and explore really this idea of how do you build this colossal uh, fixed income ecosystem in, in DeFi. So Simon, I think my first question for you is, can you just explain like the why behind why you guys put in so much work on this paper and, and, and what really what you were looking to get out of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's pretty helpful just to take a massive step back. Like why, why does Volts Labs as a team even exist? Um, and I guess at the most macro level, kind of what we really hold as our North Star is that we want to try and help um, DeFi become the financial system for the whole of the world. And frankly, in doing so, completely change uh, the way in which kind of society works all around the world. Uh, and ultimately change the lives of billions of people, um, which holding that as our North Star, like 12 months ago, uh, we kind of spotted a very clear problem that needed to be solved, um, which is actually something which I think we talked about in kind of previous podcasts around um, the fact that the ecosystem, like the byproduct of the technology is that it only produces uh, variable rates of return. Um, and not only were those rates of return at variable, they're also at times extremely volatile, which If we want DeFi to become adopted by the whole world, uh, clearly that's a problem that needed to be solved. Um, And the solution to that really is um, kind of an interest rate swap market, Um, which for anyone that's not familiar with it, it kind of sounds small. And then you look at traditional finance and it's the biggest market in the whole of traditional finance. Uh, In fact, it's cartoonishly large. Um, There's a quadrillion of notional traded each year in TradFi interest rate swaps. Um, because it is such an important uh, kind of part of a financial system. And from our perspective, we kind of launched the protocol, uh, kind of or the community actually deployed the protocol 1st of June this year. And trading volume on the protocol has been growing about 25% week on week. So there's kind of clearly kind of need for this type of instrument uh, in DeFi, which is pretty exciting. Um, but clearly as a team who are kind of spending all our time looking at rates, uh, one of the other things uh, which uh, Chase and you just touched on, which is so stark, like, like just kind of stark really, is that 12 months ago, interest rates in DeFi used to be kind of high yield, high cost of borrowing. And in TradFi, it was kind of the, the reverse. It was uh, kind of low yield, but also low cost of borrowing to the point that actually in Europe, um, you had negative rates. So you got paid to borrow, which is insane. And then if we kind of fast forward 12 months, it's completely the opposite. Um, uh, where DeFi yields have come down, DeFi borrowing costs have come down, uh, but TradFi rates have gone up, uh, both cost of borrowing, but also now the yield you get in your bank account is uh, actually better than you can get in DeFi. So so we found that just kind of theoretically interesting. Um, And we kind of wanted to understand why, like why is there this behavior where these two different rate markets behave in such a different way? And that's basically the purpose of the analysis uh, as we're exploring that, we're exploring the relationship between the two. 
But then actually more importantly, in the second part of the report, we started going into, right, yes, okay, DeFi yield has come down, but that also means that the cost of borrowing has come down. And what does that mean from an opportunity perspective for DeFi, rather than viewing this as some sort of negative, because like you said, the yield, you know, we used to have this meme where the yield in DeFi was so much better than the yield in ChadFi, right? Obviously that's changed, but what are the opportunities that come off the back of it? Can, can we start with the, like, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. Can we start with maybe like the very tip of the iceberg, so to speak? And can you tell us what you sort of found when you were trying to suss out what is the relationship in between these two different rate regimes, like the TradFi rate regime versus what's going on in crypto? Yeah, so I think there's kind of two major points that really came out of the analysis. I, I think the first, which is kind of somewhat obvious, but actually um, only feels so obvious once you've done the work, is that the two different rate regimes are anti-correlated. So as one goes up, the other goes down. Um, and you kind of feel that that anti like you, you kind of sense it, all you've got to do is look at the yields in D5 versus Chad5, and you can kind of tell that's the case. Uh, but actually when we did the analysis, we didn't expect the relationship to be as strong as it was. Um, so kind of as a first point, we found that kind of pretty interesting. But then the second point, which I think is by far the kind of more interesting point out of those two, is when we're exploring, like, why is it anti-correlated? Like, our initial thought was that as uh, TradFi rates went up, that would bring DeFi rates down. Uh, but actually, DeFi rates come down before TradFi rates even start moving. So before the central banks start putting the rates up, the DeFi rates are coming down. So, so we started trying to explore what we thought the driver of that was. And the kind of hypothesis that we have, which we kind of explore in the report, is that it's inflation. And, and this is the, the kind of where the second point gets really interesting, because we then started looking at like the time lag between inflation data being announced versus rates moving. And in DeFi, the rates came down on average 12 days after inflation data was announced, whereas in uh, TradFi, the central banks changed their rates around 100 days after the inflation data was announced. So it took them almost three months. So, and, and the reason I find this so interesting is obviously kind of we all recognize the benefits of DeFi in terms of building a global financial system, in terms of removing intermediaries and inefficiencies and all this type of stuff, um, uh, which is extremely important. But actually what we've seen in this analysis is it is also as a mechanism, uh, kind of uh, kind of programmatic market driven protocols are a lot more efficient at converting market data and changes in market data into those markets than centralized entities that are run by human beings, right? And that and actually the, the difference there is almost ten x, right? Twelve days versus hundred days. So if you think about if you really zoom out. Kind of, I think pretty much every central bank around the world was criticised for how slow they respond, uh, were, how slow they responded to changes in inflation. And if they had responded faster, who knows where all the economies in the world would be right now? We might not even be in recession, right? So, it, and kind of, if you kind of go into that even further, central banks has anything actually changed at a central bank for the past like fifty years? Have they ever changed the way in which they make their decisions? I'm not sure that they have. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying a central bank is going to be displaced by um, a decentralized protocol, at least in the short term. I don't think a central bank is going to give up monetary policy, uh, kind of get control over monetary policy. But, but at least we now have like really clear data that shows kind of uh, centralized entities using humans as those decision makers are kind of way slower than kind of market driven protocols. And what could that mean, right? If we were to kind of adopt uh, this type of mechanism, right? For that type of decision-making process, like could it mean that actually um, uh, that data was kind of absorbed a lot quicker such that the rate regime changed faster and potentially maybe global economy wouldn't even be in recession. Simon, I have a kind of 101 level markets question here for you. So you were talking about how the central bank in traditional capital markets, the central bank changes the interest rate and it took them 100 days. And in DeFi, it only took 12 days. This is my 101 level question. What, what changes the interest rates in DeFi? Market forces. 
So, so we, we, and specifically what we're looking at is we're looking at borrowing cost, costs on uh, stable coins on Aave and Compound. Um, so as people stop borrowing more, which, so basically your borrowing costs are driven of, of the utilization of the pool. So if there's loads of supply and loads of borrowing, if that's ultimately only 10% of the total supply, the cost for everybody who's borrowing is going to be low. Uh, but if you end up at kind of close to 100%, which actually we saw in the build-up to the merge, um, those borrowing costs are going to shoot up massively based on the kind of interest rate model that exists on Aave and Compound. So it's ultimately like the, the utilization is basically representative of um, like supply and demand dynamics, right? So if, if um, the supply and demand changes, then the cost of borrowing is going to change. And that's what we saw kind of in that data. Mm. I, I'd, I'd be curious, Simon, like, how do you, like, let's go back to this, uh, this negative correlation that you found. And uh, I, I sort of understand it at a high level, right? That the, the fallibility, right, of how interest rates are set in traditional markets, at least at the short end of the curve is it's all based on central banks, right? Which is just small collections of people that are very opaque and don't have very much accountability. Can you walk me through what is the transmission mechanism here? Like how actually do, how actually did DeFi respond more quickly to changes in inflation than the central banks were able to do? So, well, it's, it's, there's, it's not, I mean, it's ultimately, it's not clear entirely what, the relationship between inflation going up and DeFi rates going down is. So you can, can only kind of build hypotheses, right? And I guess there's, there's one perhaps, which is that, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of retail activity in DeFi. Um, uh, as inflation actually started going up, people had less disposable income. Um, there was less capital, therefore, to come into the ecosystem. Um, so therefore, there's less perhaps supply, there's less demand for borrowing. That all starts to suppress a lot faster than in a non-market driven environment. Um, that, I guess, is one hypothesis. Um, with a central bank, the way that that works is um, they collect loads of data. I, do you know what? I don't, honestly, there's a part of me that doesn't even know because it it's so opaque as well. Uh, but they collect, they collect a load of data um, uh, kind of with regular cadence. They have uh, monetary policy committees. Um, where they discuss that data and they make a decision on what the kind of uh, base rate should be. Um, and the time lag from uh, kind of inflation changing versus those decisions uh, being made uh, is way longer versus um, kind of obviously what we observed in DeFi, where you immediately start seeing the market forces kind of play out in the rate data of, uh, of the ecosystem. What, why does this matter, Simon? Like, why does it matter that it takes 10 times longer to change interest rates? Well, I think it's the economy ultimately. Like if, if just, if, if you can really zoom out, um, uh, imagine if central banks had responded 10 times faster. Like, honestly, there's, there's, a, there's a reasonable argument to say that we wouldn't, the global economy wouldn't be in recession. And, and what, what does that mean? It means that um, we've got, like the technology improves over time. And I, and, and I kind of find it, I find the opposite. I mean, obviously, the opportunity of DeFi is um, transformational, but there's also an opportunity for some of these old legacy structures. If they don't get displaced, then they can evolve too. So why do they not look at more efficient ways of um, making these decisions and and kind of uh, kind of adopting technology, right? Because um, I don't think a central bank has changed for the past fifty years. Yeah, mm. I have a, I have a, a the way that I was sort of thinking about this. I mean, I'd love to get your your sort of thoughts here. Before I read the the paper that you guys published, was the reason why there might be this sort of anti correlation is if crypto is in like one way to think about monetary policy and economic cycles the way you read in your textbook, right? Which is the what Fed raises interest rates and that impacts the cost of borrowing and then fewer projects get funded and then that slows growth that way. But you could sort of make an argument in this weird like Keynesian economic uh, experiment that we're running here that largely the way actually monetary policy gets transmitted is when you raise interest rates, it has an impact on the price of financial assets and financial assets go up or down based on interest rate sensitivity. And then that actually ends up dictating economic policy. It's this weird backwards way of transmitting monetary policy. And that that was kind of how I was thinking about what happened in crypto, right? We raised interest rates or 
even before we raised interest rates, the Fed signaled that they were going to raise interest rates, their forward guidance, which is kind of more important than the actual raising of the interest rates, the market believed them. And then and then one by one, we've seen risk assets collapse and crypto is kind of at the very tip of the, the frontier of risk assets. And as crypto prices collapsed, then all of these opportunities for generating yield, right? That there was the, the basis trade, right? Which is collapsing that spread in between forwards and spot uh, or futures and spot. Then there was like the grayscale arbitrage, which like has now pretty infamously exploded in the wrong in the, in the wrong direction. So that was the way I was kind of thinking about it. Is that does that kind of fit into your theory? Is that you know maybe you don't think that's the way that it, the the transmission would actually occur? I think so. I, but I think that what we saw is that DeFi responded faster than that. I mean, that's kind of what we expected to see. We expected to see ChadFi rates go up, or at least expectations of ChadFi rates go up, right? And then DeFi rates to come down off the back of it. Um, but actually, the, what the hypothesis is, is that inflation was the cause. And that actually, as inflation started to change, people stopped kind of spending money on crypto assets, right? So the prices got suppressed a lot quicker than the kind of the Fed even had begun to react in terms of expectation setting, right? And that meant that the rate regime came down. So the whole ecosystem actually responded, um, uh, well, like around 10 times faster than the Fed. Um, and that's that. I think that was the most interesting because before we did the analysis, I, I completely agree with you. That's, the, that's exactly the way in which uh, we expected it to play out, like the Fed uh, kind of uh, kind of raises rates or kind of raise expectations of a rate rise change, um, and then at the most macro level, that has an impact on the kind of proportional capital that's being allocated to higher risk assets, of which crypto is one, and, and therefore DeFi gets affected. But that's not what happened. It was uh, we think it was inflation first, DeFi came down, and then the Fed reacted. Mm. So walk us through what the implications of this are, right? Like if you look at uh, a little while ago, there was basically no concept of risk-free rate in in TradFi, right? They brought Fed funds down to 0% during March of 2020. Now that's not the case, right? And the terminal rate is over 5% as of this week's FOMC. And even like the two years, I don't know off the top of my head, but around three and a half or, or so percent. So uh, I, and, and at the same time, you're seeing almost like negative, those negative borrowing costs that we were talking about with European sovereign debt, we're now seeing in, in crypto. So what are kind of the implications of switching that dynamic on its head? Yeah, and this is kind of um, what we started to explore, just, to, just as more of a thought process, more than anything in the, in the second part of the report. And because I think um, clearly as DeFi yields has come down, there's been a lot of DeFi projects that have been kind of destroyed as a result. Like the, 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 the business model, kind of for one of a better phrase, was designed around like the fact that yield is higher in DeFi than it was in traditional finance. So I, th I guess there's some bearish sentiment around the fact that that had flipped. Um, and actually what we wanted to kind of talk about in the report is, well, like flip that on its head. What's the opportunity, right? Instead of being bearish, what's the opportunity now that these have changed? Um, and one of the things that we think at least exists in the short term is uh, the opportunity to use DeFi as a low cost of borrowing or source of low cost of borrowing, um, uh, which can obviously exist across various different uh, uh, kind of uh, products. Um, the one which we talk about, just because I think it's arguably the most interesting, is uh, fixed rate mortgages. And, and the reason that we kind of bring this up in the report is um, uh, th there's something really interesting that happened a couple of months ago where somebody bought an NFT on OpenSea where the NFT represented ownership over a physical house. So they effectively brought, bought a property by buying the NFT. And why I find that so interesting is that um, I, kind of, I haven't got into all the details of the legal structure that exists around it, but, but what we have in principle facilitated is we have facilitated the purchase of a property on chain. So that the next step is to finance Financing. the purchase yeah. of the property yeah. on chain. Mm -hmm. And what, what we kind of lay out is, again, it's just thought provoking more than anything is, is like, what are the steps to enable that? Well, the, if the NFT represents the, the kind of physical property, then the NFT clearly has intrinsic value, right? So if you can use that as uh, collateral 
on a money market protocol, such as Aave, for example, right, then in theory, you could borrow against it. Um, and if you were to do that, then effectively, you have financed the purchase of the property on chain. Is someone going to do that at a variable rate? I, I don't know. I think that's pretty risky because you don't want to get liquidated on your, your house purchase. So clearly what we talk about within it is you'd, you'd want to compose that with an interest rate swap. So you're borrowing at a fixed rate, at which point you effectively have uh, fixed rate mortgages on chain, which is pretty cool. And, and why, is that, why is that so exciting? Well, with the difference in the rate regimes, you could borrow at a fixed rate of 2% versus borrowing a fixed rate of say 6% in traditional finance at the moment. So you're getting a 3x improvement on your cost of borrowing by doing it through DeFi versus doing it through TradFi. I'm not saying it's about to happen. Like, I, I honestly, I think it's possible for it to about to happen, but if it's ever going to happen, it's going to happen now. And I think it's pretty exciting as a thought process. Mm. Uh, can we talk about the inverse of that as an opportunity as well? And the opportunity for DeFi protocols to import yields from TradFi. So we were talking about this a little bit on, you, you know, you, you just mentioned that most DeFi protocols had built their business model around having higher yields in crypto. Jason, we covered this quite a bit, but we also talked about it a lot off air. Uh, we watched Maker basically divert some of the USDC in their peg stability mechanism into Coinbase and start earning some of the yield that Center, which is the consortium between Coinbase and Circle, were earning, right? And suddenly that's a non-trivial stream of income that Maker is generating for itself. And they're just taking some of the assets that they have, dollar assets, right, USDC, and earning some of the yield that's in TradFi. And it's a pretty significant stream of income. So do you, what opportunity, if any, do you see sort of in reversing the business model? Yeah, there's, I think there's definitely opportunity there. I think one of the things that we talked about is if you were to have um, TradFi rate markets, like SOFA rate markets or Sonia rate markets, if anyone's not familiar with Sonia, if you've probably or potentially heard of LIBOR markets, that kind of Sonia is replacing LIBOR. Um, uh, if you were to have them accessible in the same exchange as DeFi rate markets, then actually in the short term, what that opens up is it opens up um, a huge amount of arbitrage opportunity based on the fact that those rate regimes exhibit anti-correlating behavior. Um, so for anybody that sits across both DeFi and kind of TradFi, every time, say, the TradFi regime kind of moved out of whack with the one in you know, so the, the DeFi based TradFi regime moved out of whack with the one in traditional finance, you could basically just arb that away. Um, and that kind of what we kind of kind of discuss in the, in, in the research is the idea that that as a uh, kind of catalyst can enable kind of more sophisticated actors to start coming into DeFi um, because there is this arb opportunity that essentially acts as like a carrot on a stick uh, to get people to start coming in. And then off the back of that, that will enable um, kind of more sophisticated kind of fixed income markets to essentially be bootstrapped in DeFi, where they're taking advantage of kind of all the underlying benefits of, of the infrastructure relative to these traditional financial markets. Let's, um, let, let's talk about a little bit about like the, let's kind of transition here into the, the second half of your report and talk about like, what are some of the other opportunities that this creates, right? Um, you know, when I just kind of sit there and close my eyes and think about these two, which I, I sort of knew beforehand, but the way you spelled it out was really helpful for me, which is there are these two different financial systems with different rate regimes, right? And eventually there's going to be some opportunity in getting those regimes to sort of talk to one another. So can you describe a little bit about what this opportunity kind of represents? Yeah, so, and I think the catalyst there is getting... Um, like so for so to say if you've got so for rate markets on chain such that they're accessible within the same trading venue then you then as a, as a trading firm you start to be able to start taking advantage of the fact that there are kind of differences in behavior in the way in which these two regimes might behave so the most kind of macro level there's obviously an arb opportunity uh, and a kind of relatively simple carry trade for anybody that kind of knows what they're doing um, uh, kind of a, the kind of a further end of that kind of spectrum, there's uh, opportunity for uh, people to take advantage of the fact that there is a lag or an observed lag in the way in which central banks react versus the way in which the DeFi markets react. Um, but off the back of bringing in these more sophisticated institutions, 
I think there's opportunity to start creating like essentially more sophisticated products like structured products, uh, ultimately long-term uh, kind of interest rate swap caps, floors, uh, non-linear derivatives like swap options, uh, kind of kind of stuff that exists in traditional finance that doesn't yet exist in DeFi. Uh, but by having those two regimes in the same place, it essentially enables you to bootstrap that market. Simon, Simon how do you import, this might be a really Can dumb I question, but yeah, how do, like how do you import the 10-year yield into it, like to be on chain it, just a just a an oracle yeah hmm. it's i mean at least yeah in the short term i don't think there's any other way of doing it it's just an oracle but it's uh it, it would depends what you're trying to do if you're trying to create a synthetic like derivative market um uh it, so long as you've got the oracle feed coming in of the overnight rate then in theory you can create a like you could create a market on that vault, at which point you'd have like a th kind of three month point, six month point, whatever different maturities exist within that ecosystem. And you think this hasn't been done yet, probably because there was no incentive to do it because rates previously were higher in DeFi. So there's no incentive to go buy a 10 year. There's no incentive to do it. And also, I think that there's a lot of just opportunity. There's a lot of white space that already existed in uh, just DeFi on its own. Um, and I think this is this is one of the things that we kind of sort of discuss in in the report, just because it's thought provoking. It's like, okay, what could what what could happen in order to bring uh, like more sophisticated institutions in and bootstrap a like kind of relatively rich and uh, kind of more sophisticated fixed income market in DeFi. But then at the same time, there's so much white space in DeFi anyway. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, does it, does this actually even need to happen in the short term? Um, or is there other stuff? I mean, particularly with the collapse of like CFI, um, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to build out all of that infrastructure uh, that and trading kind of volume kind of can migrate from what was previously in CFI exchanges into DeFi anyway. Hmm. Can we talk about, uh, I'd like to go in a little bit more detail about, so we talked about like one of the opportunities, like a big bucket, right? Being fixed rate mortgages uh, that are native to crypto or, or DeFi. The other one that you sort of just just briefly touched on there a little bit is more complex financial instruments for TradFi, like swaptions and, and those sorts of markets. But then there's also uh, products for for corporates, and that was a section that you outlined in your in your piece. I, I'd love to, you know, when I think about corporates interacting with financial markets, I usually think about them hedging raw materials and things like that, right? So. They like if you're buying a whole bunch that I it was sort of my background before this, but you know, if you're buying a whole bunch of steel or something like that, right? You don't want your gross that that's like an enormous part of your what makes up your uh, gross margin. You can't have that fluctuating 100% year over year. So you go out into the market and you buy uh, futures to sort of hedge that out. And same thing with like anything that you that go, goes into your product. Um, and then same thing with interest rate swaps. If you do business in you know multiple different jurisdictions all over the globe, you don't want to be taking interest rate risk because you can get slammed if like the dollar goes way up and you have a bunch of international business. Um, how do you think about what are some of the opportunities or reasons why corporates would want to engage in some of like on-chain products? And do, yeah, let's, let's start there actually. I, I think the short-term opportunity is lower cost of borrowing. Um, uh, and is I don't, the, the short answer is I don't, know if it'd be a corporate directly or it'd be a corporate through some sort of institution i think it's probably more likely to be a corporate through another institution where they're packaging up the low cost of borrowing that you can get from DeFi through to them um uh but then over time i, I think it's i mean there's there's a there's a whole variety of different structured products that can be built i think one of the kind of by far most interesting at the moment is that people are uh, using state ETH. I mean, this is not DeFi plus TradFi. This is just kind of like DeFi and what's native to DeFi. People are using state ETH as um, effectively thinking about it as the base rate of the metaverse, so to speak. Um, uh, and there is a kind of relatively predictable yield that comes off the back of that. Um, if you start hedging that yield away, um, you can start building all sorts of structured products. You could uh, predictably buy options, for example, of the fact that you have a predictable source of yield coming off your state ETH. Um, uh, and those types of, at least even just having access to a diversified set of yield sources um, for a corporate 
a, a very sophisticated corporate, that can start to become pretty interesting. Um, uh, but you need interest rate swap markets in order for those types of structured products to exist. Do you think that off-chain entities end up doing this? Or do you think that we're basically just in a waiting game for on-chain entities to get... Because I, I can see this happening in the next cycle with protocols that are spitting off revenue. They go to these markets. They take out a loan. Like that, the corporate loan market gets recreated and the credit market gets recreated, but only with on-chain entities. Do you think that we're basically just waiting for the like the on-chain world to get really, really big? Or, or do you think these off-chain entities in the next, in, in the next cycle are actually going to take advantage of this? Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, so I think, I, I think DeFi is going to, my, my personal opinion is I think that DeFi is, is just um, the fundamentals of the technology and the fundamentals of the ecosystem are so strong that like, the, I think the direction of travel for the whole ecosystem whilst it's kind of had a difficult second half of the year um, actually coming out the other side, we're going to end up with a much kind of like stronger set of primitives um, that kind of really facilitate kind of uh, like s the smart creation of financial markets. So I, I, my personal view is that by the next cycle, I think that's going to be massive. Um, uh, I still think that you probably end up with institute. I mean, institutions, I don't think are going to just completely disappear between now and the next cycle. Um, so I think you're still going to have institutions that are interacting with these very low level rails and much more efficient mechanisms of creating markets than a centralized entity, um, which means that uh, they may package up products for corporates, for example, uh, off these low level rails. Or what's uh, kind of amazing about DeFi is if a corporate is sophisticated enough to be able to interact directly, they may choose to do that as well. Um, but yeah, I think the short answer is, unfortunately, I think between now and the next cycle, I, I kind of, I don't think all institutions are just going to disappear, but I do think DeFi is going to essentially become the new set of rails which people are interacting uh, through, if that makes sense. This is a little bit of a callback to actually the season of Bell Curve that, <laughs> that you uh, helped us kick off. But do you ever see, you know, ultimately what we're sort of driving towards here, right? There's... Um, you know, these two separate rate regimes, but ultimately we, Jason, and I believe this is too, and I know you do as well with building vaults, that there's going to be a rich DeFi native uh, interest rate, uh, but also fixed, you know, uh, fixed income market uh, that's native to crypto. And I think the question Jason was kind of getting at there, but one that I like spent a lot of time thinking about and came up in that season of bell curve we did was, is the demand going to be greater from corporates or institutions who seek this stuff on chain? Or there are these on-chain entities, DAOs, right, that could basically they engage, everyone engages in equity financing right now, but eventually you'll have predictable cash flows and you'll be more mature and seek to add debt financing. So I'd be, I'd be curious if you see that as a potential driver eventually. Yeah, I remember it. I think there's, <laughs> there's one person that was like, yeah, it's DAOs borrowing. I forget exactly who that was. But, I think um, it was, I, it might've been Ben or... Uh, I okay. can't remember actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I remember. I remember listening to it. Uh, uh, like, I, I think a combination. I think mm. by next cycle, though, I still think a large part of it's going to be institutions. Institutions. Mm. Um, uh, th there is a kind of if you really zoom out, um, kind of it's actually more with kind of the CFI collapse. Kind of, if you really zoom out, like, how, how do you create a financial system? Uh, I kind of find that quite an interesting, like, thought-provoking question, um, because what what we've had historically is we've had um, like centralized institutions essentially acting as the gatekeepers to the whole financial world, and the issue with that, in many ways, is that those centralized institutions are extremely opaque. Um, and have got massive capacity for incentive misalignment, um, which basically means a society, like our solution to make sure that that doesn't happen is we just regulate the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but inevitably, um, by definition, regulation lags innovation. So every now and then we've had these instances where the regulators haven't understood the risks that exist in the sector, and uh, we've had these like spectacular blowups um, in centralized institutions. Um, so we saw that, it, it, I think, mo most notably in 2008, global financial crisis. And frankly, what's happened in CFI is just, in my opinion, is a repeat of that. 
It's just opaque systems, incentive misalignment, regulation isn't there, it blows up. Um, so long term, well, so, so then that kind of brings you on to well, what's the other way of creating a financial system? And I think the thing that's so exciting about DeFi is in many ways, it's polar opposite of that. Instead of having these really opaque uh, kind of institutions, you actually have transparent open source protocols. Uh, instead of having uh, kind of the capacity for incentive misalignment, you actually have these trustless systems, which nobody is in control of. Um, and then uh, kind of ultimately, it kind of in, instead of having the need to regulate, arguably because the rules of the system are known to everybody, right? Like arguably the kind of infrastructure regulates itself. So really long term, kind of coming back to your original question, I'd love like all institutions to basically kind of disappear and to be the financial system to be built off um, uh, kind of these open source kind of permissionless protocols. Um, in the by the next cycle, where do I think it's going to get to? I think there's an opportunity for uh, I think particularly trading infrastructure to completely displace kind of every form of centralized exchange. Right, like uh, and a good example of that in relation to what we're doing is London Clearing House. It's an entity in London. It's responsible for about ninety percent of the world's interest rate swap clearing. They have to employ thousands of people to maintain that exchange. Right, and kind of it still is extremely opaque, and it's regulated uh, the hell out of in order to make sure that it kind of works as it should do for society. But why does that need to exist? I don't think it does. Like I think the entire thing can be replaced with smart contracts. Um, but by the next cycle, there's still going to be institutions. I think ultimately sat on top of that, driving a lot of that volume through those through those new rails. Long answer, but I find it interesting. Yeah, no, I I do as well. Um... And maybe we can even, you know, I, I would love to, I know we've we've talked about this at length and I know I've heard you talk about it on BlockWorks podcast and other podcasts, but it would be good to maybe get back just so we like provide context for listeners who might not have that background and just about why what Volts is doing is so important and uh, why we need uh, the ability to borrow at fixed rates. Because, and I think it could, could, could we actually start with like mechanically because you, you started this episode by saying, look, there are structural reasons in the technology why we only have variable rates. I actually also found when doing that season of Bell Curve, all, there's no such thing as a 30-year fixed rate uh, mortgage in the wild either. Those also get created by interest rate swaps, right? Even if you look at LIBOR, which uh, preceded Sonia, that was variable too. And the reason was these bankers in London called them, you know, called each other overnight. And they were like, Hey, how much would you theoretically like loan me for? And they got in a lot of trouble for manipulating that eventually, but it changed based on what, not the technology, but the bankers feelings. And then that has to get hedged out with people that want to speculate on interest rates. But could you, could you just describe why, sorry, why structurally the, the rates are variable in crypto right now and why it's important for us to, to change or give people the ability to borrow, uh, you know, in fixed rates. Yeah, so this kind of, and I guess this goes back um, 12 months ago to the problem that we we're looking to solve with Vault. Um, uh, this, this, this mental framework sometimes that I use, which is uh, just, if we look at the stack, that, that the entire stack that exists in DeFi, if you go right to the bottom of the, the stack, essentially right at the bottom, you have nodes uh, that are validating blocks on a block by block basis. Um, and uh, the kind of yield that effectively comes out of those nodes is variable in nature. So right at the base of the ecosystem, you have variable rates coming out. Um, on top of that, you essentially have your protocol layer and the vast majority of protocols that have been built uh, in DeFi uh, rely on supply and demand dynamics, whereas supply and demand changes the rates that are produced out of those uh, kind of protocols changes. So again, at that layer, you have variable rates of return. And then at the very top, you kind of have uh, your kind of institutions who are building trading strategies and perhaps market making, uh, but even the most sophisticated, um, uh, even if they're kind of following some sort of market neutral strategy, that is still going to produce variable rates of return. So the entire ecosystem produces variable rates. And um, there have been times in the past where those rates have been extremely volatile. Like there's actually been instances where borrowing costs have jumped from 2% to 40% back to 2% again in, in a few days, um, which clearly if we, if we want the whole ecosystem um, to be able to serve the financial needs of the world, right? Like that can't continue to be the case. Um, and there had not been, until we kind of created faults, there had not been an efficient mechanism 
to move something from a variable rate to a fixed rate, which you know, if you think about what Volts does at the most macro level, it enables you to transition from something that is unstable to something that is stable. Um, and because that can be applied essentially synthetically across the entire stack, right? It means that there is the opportunity for the, the whole stack in many ways um, to become stable for those that want it, which uh, kind of what that means is it, has, it means that we have kind of massively expanded the use cases for the ecosystem, um, which we're starting to see play out. Like obviously we've, since we launched, we've had about 25% growth week on week, um, uh, which a lot of that is people trading um, and also like hedging risk associated with say, kind of like stake teeth. Um, uh, but we're actually also now, what's quite exciting is we're starting to see teams coming in and building new products on top of the fact that this new market exists in DeFi. So the in, the in the end state as well, just to give like TradFi analogs for why, like to just complement your sort of intuitive statement about why 2% to 40% to 2% is a problem is because if your mortgage rate worked like that, right? If you look at the, you could never do it. I mean, no one would own a house if that was if that was the case. Or, or, and or companies could never borrow like that. Companies could never borrow. Yeah. Right, right. That's the important, that's the important thing. Um, so... I guess like this, these relationships that you've outlined in in this paper, Simon. Do you do you expect that to to continue? Like one of the one of the difficulties, right, is like first of all, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, right? We know that from like statistics and stuff like that. But also, one of the things that is so hard about inflation, uh, trying to even in tradfi, like people don't have great explanations for why inflation really happens because so few instances of inflation do happen. So we just have not very many data points. So. How are we going to kind of continue to track this relationship? Should we expect it to repeat and this anti-correlation to be sustained into the future? It's, you know, it's a really interesting question because I think the closer that the two worlds become, the actually they start to inverse. They start to go from being anti-correlated to being correlated. Mm. Right? If the entire world is borrowing on DeFi rails, then you'd expect there to be some sort of correlation between TradFi and DeFi rates, right? Like heavy correlation. Um, uh, I guess the real question is what happens in the short to medium term. Um, and that's where we kind of call out the fact that anybody who's able to operate across DeFi and TradFi rate markets, um, if you have TradFi rates existing in DeFi such that you can trade the two in the same venue, then that opens up a huge amount of ARB opportunity, which clearly over time, like if you just really zoom out, like over time that ARB is clearly going to disappear as all ARBs do. Um, uh, which the other way of saying that is over time, you'd expect the two to become correlated. Yeah. If enough people are, are about that opportunity, then. The, yeah. I mean, like, honestly, if we didn't, and then if, they would go from anti-correlation to correlation. But if we didn't like, just, if we didn't have, if we had a, an absolutely zero friction between on and off ramps yeah. uh, with regards to on and off ramps, everybody would be borrowing for DeFi. <laughs> right. <you know>? Right. <laughs> which is. So funny you say that because I think that if you follow that to its like logical conclusion, every big business in crypto has been built off of bringing something in from TradFi or the real world, right? Like exchanges are the best example of that kind of like they import capital from the real world. But a really interesting business that has also done this is Circle. Circle has done a phenomenal job of importing dollars into crypto as well. And it's a structural advantage, right? That like you, ha you have to imagine people are looking at that business being like, okay, we, we would also like to do that. Or maybe it's importing instead of dollars, it's uh, treasuries. Maybe, maybe it's on-chain treasuries, right? Someone just puts that on chain. And it could be as simple as Circle. Like they just put a box in and they buy a bunch of treasuries and then they issue treasuries and there's an on-chain Oracle and Bob's your uncle. I don't yeah. know. Uh, but <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I, do you know what? I think the problem... The pro I mean, I wish it was that simple. I, my my feeling is that it's regulatory that is the the complication, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, otherwise, otherwise we'd have done it already. So. Yeah, yeah, you would guess so. Um, well, Simon, I mean, this has been a uh, first of all, we'll we'll link the you know the report that you published in the show notes. Do you have any just you know closing thoughts for for our listeners here on you know anything that we might not have covered or anything that you want you know, folks to know about vaults and, and what you guys are building. I think, I think the thing that I would say is that it is um, unbelievably straightforward. 
uh, if we wanted to, to create sofa rate markets on chain and to trade that through vaults. Um, we haven't made a decision in the short term as to whether we're going to do that or not. I think if you actually play out that medium or long-term view, of course we're going to do it, right? Like it, like it has to happen. These two worlds have to come together. Um, uh, but if there's anyone that's listening um, that is thinking kind of, wow, if those two things existed right now, there's all these things that I could do. Obviously, we'd, we'd love to be talking to them. Cool. Awesome, man. So That's great. It's been yeah, a fun appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, thanks yeah. for coming on. Oh, always fun. <laughs> always cool. fun. Yeah, good chatting with you. We'll talk to you soon. Talk. See ya. Bye. Bye.